Physical science researchers employ quantitative methods. They take measurements, collect and count data points, and formulate equations and model how systems develop. Social science researchers employ so-called qualitative methods, such as case studies, interviews, observations, and surveys to construct narratives about complex systems. The difference in methods is said to make the social sciences more subjective compared to the hard sciences. Interdisciplinary studies departments worldwide now offer courses teaching both quantitative and qualitative methods as a compromise, I suppose, intended to resist the privileging of one method over the other, for the moment anyway. But I get the feeling that there is an unstated belief that research that currently requires qualitative methods might be done by computers someday. I hear in the general background noise of our time the belief that the singularity is upon us. Aren't neural networks beginning to imitate biological thought? Don't algorithms already make predictions about what people want? As soon as they get enough of our data, AI networks will become conscious. We know this is impossible. Computers can't process semiotic information. I'm speaking on this topic today because last year the Digital Humanities Department at the university where I was teaching asked me to present my course in biosemiotics and surrounding fields as a course in quantitative and qualitative methods. The course included readings in pre-Darwinian mathematical biology, cybernetics, Alan Turing, mathematical tools for studying coincidences, self-organization, genetic determinism, etc. We also read fiction and analyzed paintings because understanding the creative process is at the center of what we do in biosemiotics, I think, anyway. As I reviewed online intro quant v qual method classes, I was horrified. This is one of the illustrations for a course I encountered. It was a real mix of scientism and propaganda techniques. A lot of social science students end up going into marketing and public policy. Here's a typical diagram suggesting how students might approach qualitative research. The caption says, a simplified diagram of the iterative qualitative research process. Basically, you just ask a lot of questions, you write down some data, you interpret it, you get more data. This diagram shows a circular and open-ended approach. Making a diagram like this conveys the feeling that your qualitative method followed some sort of scientific procedure. And I think this is scientism. Equally bad is the misuse of statistics. We were holding classes during the initial lockdown, so we had plenty of examples to draw from. We've all heard that a lot of ICUs were at a frightening 85% capacity. What's the normal operating capacity? You may or may not ask. But I wanted to do more than just help my students improve the traditional approaches. I wanted them to confront the bias against subjective knowledge, as if it's ultimately just made up stuff. As biosemioticians, we study the relational processes in living systems and discover, you could say, the etiology of symbols and how they are grounded. Subjectivity is formed by constraints that can be described, and the semiotic process can be identified and understood. I wanted to turn the course on its head and teach not the difference between qualitative and quantitative methods, but the difference between qual quantitative and qualitative processes in the systems they were studying. My students' class projects range from developing bureaucratic norms for the approval of public monuments to developing AI to pick out different musical instruments and recordings to analyzing the logic of conspiracy theories to trying to determine if the popularity of tattooing was on the wane or not and other topics about as different as they could possibly be. But in general, each student had a dynamical situation involving a group of people with many moving parts, and the student was trying either to understand or to predict and control which way the group or individual would, gro would go. We tried to identify the kinds of local decision-making processes that resulted in the global effects. There are some behaviors of complex systems that can be modeled mathematically and some that cannot. 
For example, when the system is switching from one regime to another, I suspect that there are local decisions being made that, because they haven't settled into a new habit yet, the logic of these transi transitions can only be described qualitatively. On the bottom is a computer-generated model. You'll notice the edges are more frayed. The center is more concentrated. The flock moves smoothly. It doesn't ebb and flow. The researchers define 13 different local constraints, relative distance, turn, radius, thrust, etc. And then to make it more lifelike, they said, they added a little bit of randomness to the algorithm. Well, that just doesn't work. This is the fallacy of Darwinism applied to complex systems. Randomness plus natural selection does not lead to self-organization. What the researchers need to add is semiotically motivated local decision points, but how could they do that? The emergence of novel semiotic interactions depends on chance similarities and proximities which are harnessed to build new structures. The individual observer who is making local decisions in response to the constraints from his neighboring observers is making relatively objective observations of qualitative information processing because he's actually part of the system he is observing. The individual actions help create and are created by the dynamics of the group. Relatively objective observations are made by the person with a lot of experience who has intuition but he is not really guessing as so much as drawing upon the semiotic structures that are part of the way his subconscious brain has organized itself in response to his social system. So one way to do better qualitative research, obviously, is to immerse yourself in your subject instead of trying to be an external objective observer. The social sciences are said to be the systematic study of human interactions. So Students are typically taught procedures to follow in order to study a complex system. Instead, students should be trying to discover the procedures of the complex system, learning about the system's semiotic mechanisms, which will be unique to each system and will be continually evolving. On the left are experts, four doctors working on the front lines of COVID-19. Each of these doctors broke rank to find effective treatments. One found COVID-19 presents like altitude sickness and patients needed oxygen instead of a ventilator. One found that a malaria drug happens to work as a prophylaxis. One found that an antiparasite drug happens to work as an antiviral. Another realized that like HIV, COVID might require different drugs at different stages. One of the drugs these doctors discovered works due to complex molecular mimicry, ivermectin, which mimics the structure of an enzyme produced by soil bacteria, it happens to bind with the virus spike protein and with our ACE2 receptors and plays a role in two other signal pathways inside cells as a general antiviral and an anti-inflammatory. The official response of the health bureaucracies has been to scoff at the idea that ivermectin could work as an anti-parasite drug and have other effects as well as if biological systems can't interpret structures in different ways. Quantitative versus qualitative could be called systematic versus idiosyncratic. Dictionary.com happened to give me this nice example of how the term might be used in a sentence. The best minds are idiosyncratic and unpredictable as they follow the course of scientific discovery. Sometimes we play lip service to eccentric researchers. We celebrate them after the fact of their making a novel discovery, but the public doesn't have a systematic way of appreciating the idiosyncratic logic of complex systems. Biosemiotics offers a way to explain how idiosyncratic semiotic processes work with the concepts of symbol, icon, and index. First, let's look at the mechanism of the conventional symbol. As Marcello Barbieri argues, an, en an encryption apparatus, an adapter with two recognition sites, can connect two objects. The rules of this assembly are established by convention. 
They are not strictly determined by the two objects, in this case the genes and the proteins. The natural encryption-decryption process, as Barbieri says, creates absolute novelties, not relative ones. These natural conventions account for the discontinuities in the history of life, the qualitative changes, whereas natural selection explains the gradual transformations. These conventional codes are fixed by natural selection, but how do novel associations arise in the first place so that they are available to natural selection? Well, we have the mechanism of the icon. The cell receptor, like an individual bird in a flock, responds to signals that have qualities which could be similar to the qualities of other things. Here we see how the wrong molecule, a molecular mimic, may happen to fit into a cell receptor. This can lead to an unpredictable outcome that is qualitatively different, and you won't just get more or less of the same product. For instance, a virus might fit into our ACE2 cell receptors and repurpose our cellular machinery. Big qualitative difference there. Mechanism of the index. In my class, we discussed how slime mold can associate a temporal rhythm with a temperature decrease. The rhythm becomes an index for blasts of cold air, and this is a kind of Pavlovian conditioning. In this instance, the mechanism seems to involve a number of oscillating chemical reactions that can become entrained. In my class, we also discussed another example of slime mold Pavlovian conditioning, where the separate activator inhibitor pathways for detecting food and for detecting cold can become entangled and flip a disinhibition switch that makes the slime mold start seeking food in cold places which is sort of like, it's kind of a pathological behavior. Both of these examples are. But they show how slime mold can learn new things. Oscar, Joshua, and I wrote up this for a forthcoming paper in co um, for the Code Biology special issue. Pavlovian conditioning is learning via index signs, which may go awry. This may be what's behind the weird allergies and uh, food sensitivities. Don Nolan has written about this kind of thing in the food and medicine volume that has just come out. This is a mechanism for artificially inducing antibody responses. It illustrates Marcello's adapter mechanism. Since the 1970s, researchers have been developing anti-fertility vaccines. In one case, the human horn hormone HCG is linked to a tetanus toxoid by a conjugate. When injected with the product, subjects develop antibody responses to the tetanus and to the HCG by association, and if the subject becomes pregnant, the developing embryo will be spontaneously aborted. The conjugate here plays the role of an encryption apparatus. The body learns to misassociate a part of itself, HCG, with a toxic substance. This is a qualitatively different process than the normal process of an antibody response. This new symbol is intentionally created by physically linking two objects together, but as with the case of slime mold just mentioned, accidental linkages may form when different chemical pathways are activated simultaneously and happen to interact with each other. This may explain the link between autoimmune diseases and vaccines and viruses. Let me now mention how biological processes that can be quantified relate to those that cannot. Quantitative methods may be appropriate for modeling how any complex system as a whole stays more or less the same or changes predictably. Quantitative methods are good for categorizing and generalizing they are also good for describing development, but not evolution. They are also good for describing styles, fashions, and trends, even good for analyzing and producing formulaic art. There is a program that can render photos into a Van Gogh Starry Night style. To the extent that it's easy to find the formula for a style, we can guess that the style does not require so much qualitative judgment. 
Quantitative methods can be used for mimicking, for creating mediocre art, but they aren't that good at creating original art. On the left is a fake Rembrandt painted by an AI program. On the right is a painting done by a human in the Rembrandt school, which was mistaken as a Rembrandt by scholars for many years. Old woman cutting her nails is considered to be a masterful work that goes beyond merely skillful, merely beautiful, and is more interesting than the many portraits that Rembrandt did as commissioned work. The AI had to be trained on a lot of data to come up with its generalization for its output. So the AI was trained on Rembrandt's hack work. AI designers just don't get it. There just isn't an academic, systematic way of approaching novelty, and that's why I've been focusing on what I call accidental in indexes and icons. This image is from the subreddit Accidental Renaissance. This is a photo, not a painting by Raphael, although the pale skin and shadow may remind you of the Renaissance painter. The halo of the man's camo hat and his posture give him a Saint Sebastian vibe. Here is the saint in the typical Renaissance style. Note how uncanny is the coincidental similarity. When we recognize the Renaissance style in this photo, we might use abduction to explain it. And here's Charles Sanders' purse on abduction. A surprising fact is observed. The photo looks like a Renaissance painting, but if it's true that the photographer is familiar with Renaissance art, his deciding to snap the photo would be a matter of course. Hence, there is reason to suspect that it's true that the photographer is probably familiar with Renaissance art. That's my theory, anyway. Conspiracy theories get started through the logic of abduction. In this paper written in January 2020, the researchers note the uncanny fact that there are four HIV-like segments in the novel part of the SARS-CoV-2 sequence. But if the virus was engineered in a lab, its having HIV-like segments might be a matter of course. Hence, there's reason to suspect that SARS-CoV-2 is in fact engineered. The moon sign is an accidental index. Strange coincidences also happen at the level of the biological cell or among massively interacting parts of a complex system. If you show these pictures to hundreds of people, the number who see the connection or don't see the connection will not be 50-50 or random. Likewise, when individuals in any group interpret coincidences, the different interpretations will not follow a random distribution, but a pattern. That's why, I guess, just adding randomness to the flocking al algorithm produces mechanical movement, not lifelike movement. Living organisms with brains, or cells without brains, can detect and act on patterns. Sometimes the pattern is just coincidental. Creativity is, in part, the ability to notice and make use of possibly coincidental patterns. That coincidence can be similar appearance, as with the icon, or just being connected in space and time, as with the index. Processes that create qualitatively novel products or effects may use the abductive logic that draws on accidental similarity and arbitrary association. You may not be able to quantify this process, but it's not merely subjective. It's not really determined by the researcher's subjective interpretations. It might be more correct to say that the subjective interpretation occurs in the process itself.